Good morning. Good morning. Well, today is a very important day. It's the day that we're going to celebrate uh, the Sanctity of Life uh, Sunday. And uh, this is the, uh, the anniversary, the unfortunate anniversary of Roe versus Wade and the, uh, the legalizing of abortion and uh, tragically, 55 million, it's estimated, abortions have happened since then. And uh, we know that God created us in his own image from the very time we were conceived. And so we want to show you this video and just listen to this, uh, this lady's story. And we want to then uh, just encourage you, at the end of the service, there are some baby bottles on the back table. If you'll just grab one of those, those baby bottles, um, this, and you can put some money, some change in there, and then in a few weeks, bring them back. And we'll give those to Anchor Point Ministry, which is uh, just down the road. And they support uh, ladies that are, that are pregnant and are looking for, for some help. And so we want to support that ministry and help them because life is so precious. So let's go ahead and uh, let's watch this video. I was in floundering relationships and I was medicating my emotional pain with alcohol. Like a lot of women, I believe the lie that abortion is a choice like any other choice. The abortion of my baby is a decision that I deeply regret. It forced me to have to take responsibility for the fact that I had paid someone to kill my child. And I have to live with those consequences. In 1981, I was a pastor's daughter attending a Christian college when a positive pregnancy test threatened to derail my plans for graduate school. Abortion was legal. It was advertised in the phone book. It had physicians involved. It had the government stamp of approval. And it really seemed like the logical decision to make. In fact, I can remember thinking, if I ever become pregnant, well, I can just have an abortion without really knowing what that meant. And I really wanted to believe that abortion would erase my pregnancy and my life would be just like it had been. Pregnancy changes you. And I came to learn that it doesn't matter how the pregnancy is resolved, whether it's through childbirth or miscarriage or abortion, you are forever changed by that pregnancy. A few years after my abortion, I hit the wall. I can still remember where I was the first time I saw pictures of fetal development of the baby in the womb. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, it forced me to have to take responsibility for the fact that I had paid someone to kill my child. And that was really a life-changing moment for me because in taking that responsibility, I was able to start moving toward healing. It reminds me of the verse in Genesis 3 when God confronts Eve about her choice in the garden. And Eve responds, the serpent deceived me. And I can say that too, the serpent deceived me too. And now I can look back and see that that abortion was not harmless. It was not a choice like any other choice. And I have to live with those consequences. January 22nd, 2013 will mark 40 years of legal abortion in the United States. And I can look back over those 40 years and say without a doubt, the world is not a better place because of abortion. Women are not in a better place because of abortion. What it's created is a world where you're almost expected to abort if you're pregnant at an inopportune time. It's created a society where it's easier to push women toward exterminating their babies than it is to accommodate them with their needs as mothers. And legalized abortion has created a culture where abortion feels like your only choice if you want to keep your place in the workforce or continue in school. That's not empowerment for women. That's bondage. The good news is there is hope and healing after abortion. 
the God that created us in His image, can heal our wounds, He can redeem our heartache. And there is hope and new life in Jesus Christ. I have found that healing. I have found that forgiveness. And I know that it's available for every woman and for every man who has also believed the deceiving lies of abortion. Let's, let's pray. Father, uh, just help us. Lord, forgive us for our, our terrible um, turning from you, Lord, and help us, Lord, to turn back to you. And uh, God, thank you so much that there is forgiveness, that there is redemption, that uh, you, you died for all of our sins. And we're all sinners. And we all need your forgiveness and your grace. So, Lord, help us to love the, the unborn. Help this nation to love the unborn. Help the world to love those that are created in your image. And, Lord, help us to do those things that we need to do. Help Anchor Point and help us in, as we support this ministry to, to help, uh, help them to encourage women, to stand alongside of women, stand alongside of men Lord, who are facing a really tough decision. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, last Sunday, we started off our series on, on marriage. And, we, and I talked about um, the, the sermon that, for a second, escaped my mind. <laughs> that was such a good sermon. It escaped my mind. So what, what did I preach on last week? Yeah, prayer. You know, the, the secret of marriage, that when you... Focus your marriage on Jesus Christ and that Christ and the church came together through Christ's death on a cross for our sins. And you focus on that rather than on yourself. And then the practice is to pray. Pray every day out loud with your spouse and practice that. I hope you've been practicing that this, this week. Praying together with your spouse. Do that every day and see the, the great changes that it will make. And so this morning, we're going we're gonna to talk about marriage. What is it? Is it a covenant or is it a contract? Is it a covenant or is it a contract? I was talking to a friend a while back, and uh, he, was, he was living with his girlfriend, and he knew where I stood on that, uh, that that's uh, it's not the right thing to do. You need to get married. And he told me, he said, well, you know, what's a piece of paper? A piece of paper is not going to help my relationship at all. That's all it is. It's just some piece of paper that you sign on, and it's no, no big deal. And that is a, a common attitude of our society that we are facing, that, that marriage is, is really just a piece of paper. It's nothing more than that. And, the, and our society says that, that love is measured by the amount of emotion, the amount of feelings that you have towards someone else. If you have a lot of emotions, you have a lot of feelings, then you're in love. You fall in love. Of course, if you fall in love, you can fall out of love. Is that the right perspective? Is that the biblical perspective on what love really is? You know, there's been times in, in my marriage that I haven't felt romantic emotions toward my wife. For example... Okay, now let me finish. Let me finish, okay? I heard some gasping there, but I'm going to explain to you what I mean, okay? At 3 a.m. in the morning, when that baby starts crying, wah, wah, and my wife's already been up twice with the baby, and so then she nudges me in the back, come on, your turn, your turn. At that moment, I didn't have these overwhelming emotions, this gushy, gushy feelings. I love you. I didn't go, yeah, I'll get the baby. Yeah, I love you. It, it, it just wasn't there. I didn't feel it. I didn't feel anything for the baby necessarily either. <laughs> I felt like I wanted to go to the house next door, somewhere else and sleep and get some sleep. That's all I wanted. S but I, that's not what I did. I didn't went to take care of the baby, Okay. Because love is more than a feeling. Now, feelings certainly will come alongside of love. We'll talk about that some more, but it's not at the essence of feeling. I mean, honestly, do we always have a fluttering heart? 
Uh, Pitter-patter in your heart for your spouse. Uh, anyone here has always had that? Okay, all right, see that hand? Okay, now I, I have a lie detector over here. I want you to, I want you to come over here and uh, take the test. <laughs> so we don't always necessarily have those ushy-gushy feelings. So now you've got to ask yourself the question, what is marriage? Is it love until the feelings depart or love until death do us part? So I want to answer these two questions. Is love just a feeling or, and also is marriage a covenant or is it a contract and what's the difference between those two? So let's take a look at the first point. So love is not just a feeling, it's a choice. There was a book years ago written that love is a choice. And that's, that's my point here, first point here this morning. I want to look at a story that we've been reading recently in our three-year Bible reading as, as a church in 2 Samuel 11, 2 through 5, with King David. And King David had some emotions. He had some attraction. And let's look what happened. Verse 2, And it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. King David, it said in verse 1 that this is the time of year that kings would go off into war and to battle, and, and David was not off in battle. He was idle. There's a saying, it's not in the Bible, but the saying is, idle hands make the devil's workshop. And it's so true. And so here he is idle. He's got time on his hands, and he just happens to be looking out, and he sees this woman bathing. So he has emotions. He has attraction. Kind of felt maybe romantic. So he sends for her, and he gets her. And, of course, she comes, and she follows through. She is part of this, and then she becomes pregnant. And then David has to go through all these means to cover it up. You know, just like in the Garden of Eden where they shifted the blame. So he has to shift the you know, try to cover it up. And so he has um, her husband killed, and so on the story goes. And it's just, you know, just an awful, terrible story. Well, you know, as men, we have attractions. We have, you know, pulls in, in our heart. Women do too. But I want to just talk about the men this morning. You can go and be idle and get behind a computer, and no one's looking, no one's watching, humanly, and you can be behind the computer and, and see whatever you want to see on that computer, and you could say, yeah, I'm attracted to that. I'm just a red-blooded man. Come on. This is just the way it is. But that doesn't make it, make it right because love is a choice. Love is not just an emotion. Love is not just a feeling. Modern culture says love equals romance. So as long as you have emotions and attraction, then you have love. But we know, just even from psychology, we just know that emotions do what? They go up. If they go up high for a while, guess where they're going to go? They're going to go down. And then they naturally go back up, and then they go back down. And so what happens? You go from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship because love is defined as emotion and as romance. And this all came out on the Enlightenment it used to be, you know, love was about social status and taking care of your family. And then it shifted over towards whatever your feelings are and how you feel on the inside. And, you know, and this is one of the reasons that there's so much sex outside of marriage because there's the thrill of the hunt. And there's emotion in that. And there's attraction in that. And so that feels so much like love. But as the Bible says, sin, pleasure lasts for a season. Sin lasts for a season, but then it fades away, and the consequences um, have to be, be paid. Now, 
In Jesus' day, there was this kind of attitude as well. And Jesus faced the religious leaders in Matthew 19, verse 3, and they brought a question to him, and it says this, And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? During that time, there were two schools of thought. There was uh, Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai, and they had different viewpoints on this. Hillel said, you can divorce your wife for pretty much any reason. Rabbi Akiba said, if you see another woman that looks more attractive than your wife, then you can divorce your wife and marry her. All right, he took it to that extreme. Shammai said, it's only for, only reason you can divorce is for, for sexual offense. And so Jesus is going to give his answer. And in verse 4, he says this. He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So how does Jesus define marriage? Jesus defines marriage as one man and as one woman, the two becoming one flesh. And they hold fast to each other like glue. If you were to take a, a board and put wood glue on and stick it together, that's the picture of it is they hold fast to one another. They stick to each other like glue. Now there are, I know someone will ask, well, what about the exception clause? And, and I think that there's an exception for uh, sexual immorality uh, and then, desertion from 1 Corinthians 7 by an unbeliever. There are only two possibilities, but even those situations, that's not your first option. Re reconciliation and keeping the marriage together is always what God wants. See, marriage is based upon a commitment on a choice. And Jesus Christ demonstrated love to the greatest extent because when he died for us, he wasn't dying for someone lovely he was dying for, for someone who was sinful, who had turned their back on him, and we were actually his enemies. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. He died for his own enemies. We were his enemies enemies. We turned our back on him. We were the, the ugliest, the meanest, the baddest bride ever. And he, baddest, I know it's not a word, okay. He still died for us. He still loved us that much. Now think about it. In the Garden of Eden, Adam had a choice. And he had, a, he had something that was pleasurable to him, to take the fruit. There was that feeling, there was that emotion. And he followed that and he went after that. Okay, that wasn't love. But then you go to the other garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus Christ is in the garden. And he says, Lord, if there's any other way, let it be done that way. But if not, I'm going to do your will, Lord. I'm going to, Father, die on the cross for their sins. If that's what you say I need to do. And he did it anyway. He made a choice, and he died for us, the unlovely and he did it out of love. See, that's what true love is. Even when you don't feel like it, you still do it. Now, someone says this morning that I know what they're going to say. They're going to say, oh, so you want me to be a hypocrite, Mike. You want me to fake it. You want me to go against my feelings, how I actually feel. You want me to be a hypocrite. And my answer is yes. But let me explain. You can be a hypocrite either to your flesh or to the Holy Spirit. You say, Mike, what do you mean by that? Well, the Bible says that within us, if we're believers in Jesus Christ, we have the flesh that we passed down from Adam, all these desires, these desires you know, to, to have outbursts of anger, to have dissensions, to have envy, to have jealousy, to have adultery, to have murder, all those things in Galatians 5 that Paul talks about. That's the flesh. Those are the desires that we have. But at the same time, we're wrestling, and there's a struggle within us, and the Spirit is wrestling and saying, no, 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 love, joy, peace, faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. That's what you need to have. So you're going to make it, you're going to be hypocrite to one or the other. One or the other, what are you going to be hypocrite to? 
be a hypocrite to your flesh. Say, no, I'm not going with those emotions, those desires. I'm going to go with what the Holy Spirit says. So, yeah, you're going to be a hypocrite one way or another, but be a hypocrite to your flesh. So I want you to look at your neighbor and say, be a hypocrite to your flesh. All right? <laughs> All right. You can, I've given you permission to be a hypocrite, but be a hypocrite to your flesh and not to the Spirit. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. So you got to deny passions. you got to deny lusts. We all do. I was talking to a friend the other day who was saying that when he first became a Christian, he struggled with this because he said, he was telling the counselor, he said, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel like loving other people. I didn't have these ooey gooey feelings to go and help this person and do that. And the counselor said, just go ahead and do it anyway. I want you for the next four weeks, just every situation that you're in, I want you to love that person and be kind to them, say nice things to them, go out of your way to help them. He said, really? He said, yeah. So he said he did it for one week, and it felt so unnatural. It felt so, ah, oh, just didn't feel right, but he just did it. And then he did it another week, and it didn't feel so bad. It was, and then in the third week, he's like, wow, all of a sudden, this is getting to be kind of cool. And by the fourth week, he said, I was just had so much love, and I just wanted to love and help each other, and all of a sudden, I was changed. And then the feeling started following the actions. And he had all this desire for love. And so that's the same way. And even with Christ, he asks us to do things that we don't want to do. But when we do them, then, then the feelings follow. But the action's got to come first. And so how does that apply to marriage? Well, that makes marriage a covenant, not a contract. And there's a difference. Look at the verses we read this morning, Matthew or Malachi 2, 13 through 16 says this, and this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was a witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with the portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless, faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. They were coming in at that time in the Old Testament. Of course, they had animal sacrifices before Christ uh, finished all that with his perfect sacrifice. They would come and offer these sacrifices, and God was saying, I am not pleased with those sacrifices at all. And they said, why? Well, you're not being faithful to your wife. You've made a covenant with your wife. You're not being faithful to her. So how can I be pleased with any kind of sacrifices you bring? Because that covenant is so important, and it's so strong. A covenant is for as long as we both shall live. A contract is as long as we both shall love. Okay, there's a, there's a difference. You know, some uh, wedding ceremonies now have the vows say, as long as we feel this way, I, I'm going to love you. As long as I feel these emotions, I'm going to love you. But that's not what God wants, he wants a covenant. A covenant is a signing, it's a binding of the hearts, and a contract is the signing of names. I want to contrast the attitudes here. A contract says, you had better do it. Covenant says, how may I serve you? Contract says, what do I get? Covenant says, what can I give? Contract says, what will it take? Covenant says, whatever it takes. Contract says, it's not my responsibility. Covenant says, I'm happy to do it. Contract says, it's not my fault. Covenant says, I accept responsibility. Contract says, I'll meet you halfway. Covenant says, I'll give you 100%. Contract says, I'll be faithful for now. Covenant says, I'll be faithful forever. Contract says, I'm suspicious. Covenant says, I'm trusting. 
Contract says it's a deal. And covenant says it's a relationship. Quite a difference. So how do you view your, your marriage? Is it a covenant or is it a contract? God says it's a, it's a covenant that we keep. You know, the studies have found that marriages that are struggling and rocky, that two-thirds of them, if they just stay together within five years, those marriages will be doing very well. And so often people just jump out and run out of those marriages before, before they should. And what keeps it together? The vows, the commitment, the vows is what keeps it together. Now, Ephesians 5, 31 summarizes this well. And this is the main passage that I'm using for this marriage series is Ephesians 5. And it says this, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And remember, that hold fast is this covenantal term. Deuteronomy 10.20 uses the same term. You shall feel the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name you shall swear. And it's that covenantal word. And so I want to share with you some of the traditional vows. Maybe you use these vows in your marriage, but I really like them. And it says this. I, Mike Bauer, take you, Sean Bauer, it's my case, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part according to God's holy law. And this is my solemn vow. That's how serious it is. And I said those words. By God's grace, I'll I'll keep those words. Stay committed to those words. That's what a marriage is. And someone says, oh, man, that's just duty. That's just, you know, slugging it through, just doing it, even though you don't feel like it. You know, Chris Rock, remember last week we said it, he said, which would you rather be, single and lonely or married and bored? So some people think, well, marriage is just going to be boring. But the Bible doesn't say that at all. The Bible says that there is a lot of emotions that come from true committed love. Read the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon 8, 6, 7. The, at the end of this, this great love story, it says, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, house, he would be utterly despised. You know, just see the strength, the the emotion, and that that poetry that's written, and just this, this love. And I think about, you know, my relationship with Sean and when we got married, and there was definitely emotions, and you know, just that I loved her so much. But at, over time, that's grown, and it's grown, and it's grown, and it's grown. It's got deeper and deeper and deeper. And our friendship on fire has gotten, has gotten, is even more on fire. So now that my wife is embarrassed, I'll keep going. <laughs> So love is a choice, not a feeling. But you make the choices, the right choices, and the feelings will follow. Now, I want to add another little extra in here, okay? I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm going to have uh, as big of a crowd next week because I'm going to add this in here, all right? Let me give you some of Mike's wisdom and counsel. This is my wisdom, and I think there's some biblical backup for it. Can't nail it down as an absolute. But I want to talk to you about dating. If love is a choice and not just a feeling, why would you date when you're not ready to be married? If all you can go on is feelings, you're not at the age, you're not at the the capability, you don't have the responsibility yet in your life, you don't have a job, (laughs) you you don't have the things going for you in your life, you're just not ready to be married then why put all those emotions and feelings on the line when you're not ready? Mike's advice. Think about that. And someone says, well, but you know what? You can learn so much from those dating relationships. You can, just by going through those tough times, you know, ups and downs, you learn a lot. Well, that's true. You might. But I will bet and say that you can learn even more by having self-control. 
You know, when you're really, really young, you're not ready to be married, have self-control. Just wait. Don't, don't put your, your heart out on the line so early. Because love is a choice. All right, now that I've got everyone happy with me right now. <laughs> but I would say this. Do it at a time when you're ready. Get, a, get people around you that are your friends and your, your parents and people you trust, people in church, and say, hold me accountable and help me to be ready for marriage and, and hold me accountable to my relationship. And, and then ask them, am I ready to be married? If I'm not ready to be married, I'll just hold off and just wait. All right, Mike's free advice. All right, everyone's smiling, right? <laughs> All right, but now... I think we want to use this verse, Solomon 3, 5, to back that up. It says this, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you do not stir or up or awaken love until it pleases. There's a right time for love. And wait until that time is right. Psalm 23, 1, our memory verse this week says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When you make the Lord your shepherd... When you make him all that you need, all that you want, he takes care of your needs, then you can say, I shall not want. I don't need anything else. Now, I want to say this in closing to the, to the married couples. I want to encourage you to do this one thing, okay? I encouraged you last week to be praying together every day out loud. So now I want to encourage you to do this this week. Take these vows, these traditional vows, and repeat them back to each other one time every day this week. Just look at your spouse in her eyes and say these vows back to them and say them to each other. And see what that does for emotions. There's commitment. You're, you're going over your commitment again, but see what that does for emotions. And then to each other, say to each other one thing that you really appreciate about them and be specific. Something that you're so thankful and grateful for them and how they help you and how they encourage you and how they help you. So I encourage you to do that. On the way out, we have little cards. Take one of those with you, and I encourage you to do that. And I want to get some reports back. I'd love to get some reports, too, after church. If you've been praying together, what that has done for your marriage. And do the same thing next week, and let's see what happens. And, you know, if we did this, I think we would see amazing things. I think we would see marriages strengthened in this church, and then... It would strengthen our church. We'd become a light to the community. We'd become a light to this nation. We'd become a light to the world. If we all had these marriages strengthened, what it would do. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much that you made a covenant with us, not just a contract, that you're committed to us forever. Lord, the new covenant, thank you for shedding your blood for us, even though we were so unlovely. God, help us, Lord, to, to have a covenant approach to marriage. Uh, help us to keep our covenants, Lord. We, we don't have the strength within us to do that, so help us, Lord, this week. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now Sam is going to, one of our elders here at Oak Creek is going to come up and uh, 